Men love Fight Club. Most films made over 20 years ago have long been forgotten, but among the tiny few that maintain their relevancy, Fight Club always comes on top. Because Fight Club is more than just a film, it's quite literally a religious story. The story begins deep within the narrator's mind, as we're shot through his consciousness and into the mouth of the narrator, where Tyler is preparing to turn society into rubble and begin the revolution. But how did it get to this? Well, it starts in a regular day in an artificially lighted, soul-crushing office. The narrator is a sleep-deprived, caffeinated drone. Everyone is a copy of a copy, printing the same things, dressing the same, and drinking the same Starbucks lattes. The narrator is quite literally a slave to the 9 to 5, with his only passion being IKEA furniture. What kind of dining set defines me as a person? By living such a monotonous life, his body can no longer rest. He's never asleep, but he's never awake either. So to deal with this, he goes to find people who are deep in despair, as a way to not only feel better about himself, but also to form the deep connection that is missing in his life. One of the first people he meets is a man called Bob. Bob fears for his masculinity. His testicular cancer has reduced him to a blubbering mess who's been stripped of his masculine energy. A man whose hormones morph from testosterone to estrogen. A man who's lost his children's respect. A man whose life is expiring fast. The narrator shares his pain, he feels that lost connection. And so the narrator becomes addicted to the men's whole group. Because there's none of this connection anywhere else. When their workspaces, opinions, hobbies and tastes are all the same, people can't connect on that deeper level. It's only times of despair that can foster any semblance of human connection. But then why have men become so weak? What is behind this male despair? Well I've spent countless hours studying this phenomenon and there are three main things causing this. And they might surprise you. But before we go into that, we need to see how Fight Club tackles masculinity in the 21st century. The story cuts forward to the narrator living out his regular life, a life of wasting time, doing meaningless, unfulfilling tasks, and watching his life end one minute at a time, where everything is packaged in atomized portions, shampoo condition combos, sample package mouthwash, tiny bars of soap, living a transient life where everyone he meets disappears again on the next flight, over and over. The only interesting thing in his life is the fantasy of dying in a plane crash. However, it's on one of these fights where the character Tyler Durden is introduced. A man who's the opposite of the narrator in every way. A man's man. With a big leather jacket, shades, and unlimited confidence, Tyler Durden begins to change everything. His calm, stoic confidence with his fatalistic outlook makes for a perfect testosterone-laced aura. And as he drives off in a stolen sports car, the narrator goes back to his regular life, only to find all his possessions have gone. His IKEA home has evaporated. His identity and past life has been reduced to ash. It's in this moment where the narrator begins to regain his true masculinity. Okay, so then what is causing men to feel so weak? What's behind this male disconnect in real life? Well, I think one of the main reasons behind this is that men no longer have any means of self-expression or deep connection. See, what I think Fight Club really taps into is the kind of shallow avatars we've become, where real authentic connection fades behind the 9-to-5 struggle. When you live this 9-to-5 existence in a decaying dystopian megacity, you never get that shared struggle or accomplishment. Instead, we're just working in the same room on tasks that don't engage us or put us in a natural flow state. Instead, we live a lifestyle that numbs us into flaccid apathy, devoid of passion, healthy aggression or connection. Instead of us going out into the world, exploring the unknown, facing shared adversity, and overcoming it for the benefit of the group, we now do the same task silently at our desks. The fact is that average life for so many men means that their relationships are always functioning on a surface level. And with so many limited connections, we turn to supposedly social means of relaxing. Going on Tinder, playing video games, going to the bar to supposedly unwind. You see all these men piling up in sticky low-end clubs to bathe in the waters of the profane, destroying their body to the crescendos of recycled thumping bass, scantily dressed paralytic women, and salivating droog-like men, rushing to the refuge of an inebriated stupor to fill some sort of connection. These low end bars, clubs and Tinder are like a slot machine, where you spend your money and time to get hooked on the prospect of winning a sloppy disconnected hookup. If deep social connections were normal for men, if men felt connected to their labour and the people around them, but they felt like a healthy, unrepressed individual, there would be no need for any of this. We wouldn't be wasting our lives getting drunk, standing out in dead-end clubs until God knows when, to be with everyone else who's doing nothing with their lives, all for the hopes of meeting someone to get off of, and then only to repeat this cycle every single week, all because you just want to feel that love and connection you never had. It makes it hard to be an upwardly mobile young man when your life is defined by throwing your money at video games and getting plastered in a pool of vomit. And in the last few years, with jobs going remote, people becoming 
becoming unemployed and robots replacing manual labor, we've become even more depressed and isolated. And men are on the brunt of all of this, with male suicide rates reaching an all-time high in recent years, because men lack the social connection and purpose that necessitates a happy life. Okay, so then how can this be fixed? What's the solution to this deep-rooted problem? Well, this is what Fight Club seeks to work out. After the narrator comes back to find all his possessions burnt to the ground, his male transformation begins. So in a last-ditch effort for redemption, the narrator calls Tyler, where they discuss his possessions and identity being destroyed. As he runs about his possessions being destroyed, Tyler reminds him how destructive this consumer mindset really is. He talks about how this makes men weak, detaching us from our hunter-gatherer instincts. We are byproducts of a lifestyle obsession. Tyler describes this as being one of his main concerns with society. His concerns on crime, war, or poverty. It's celebrity magazines, televisions with 500 channels, Viagra, Xanax. Tyler describes all these comforts as just being coping mechanisms for living in such an unnatural world. To revert back to what is truly felt, Tyler asks the narrator to punch him. He wants to feel something. He wants to be taken back into the now, the present, and feel a swell in his masculine energy. And so they begin to beat each other hand to hand. After the fight, they go back to Tyler's house, which is a rundown, abandoned, disgusting house with boarded up windows, leaking pipes, and infested with moss, all to destroy the narrator's addiction to comfort. And within a month, the narrator no longer misses TV. He doesn't miss his possessions. He enjoys the discomfort. He's confident and aggressive, and other men become allured by his life. They gather by the dozens to fight with each other, all of them wanting to fill their untapped masculine energy. This pattern only continues to grow. All these men who are fed up with being weak losers, these men who have lost their way, who feel resentful of the world around them, leading to the formation of an underground group known as Fight Club, a club dedicated to rejecting what they claim to be feminine conformist indoctrination. And it's around this time that the narrator starts to be perceived differently. He's now seen as an individual. In fact, all of the people at Fight Club now stand out from the rest. They aren't just carbon copies anymore. They are battered, they dress and act differently. These aren't the same men. With this rejuvenation of the masculine and rejection of the mundane conformity, the narrator becomes hungry. He becomes hypersexual. He smokes in his office. He looks at disgust at the drones surrounding him. The comfort, the passive aggressiveness and mundanity. He sacrifices all of this to revel in the discomfort. You give up the condo life give up all your flaming worldly possessions. This idea of sacrifice and comfort becomes central to the ethos of Fight Club. To join Fight Club, you have no choice but to fight. Comfort is consumerism, and Fight Club seeks to kill both of these things. Because to these men, comfort is what made men so weak. And one of the biggest causes of comfort is the narrator's nine to five job. So to move away from this cushy, sterile office life, the narrator and Tyler begin to make soap. Why soap? Well, this becomes clearer later on. But for now, the two raid a liposuction clinic for human fat to make soap. And during this process, Tyler pours lie onto the narrator's hand as an initiation. How much comfort is he willing to sacrifice for his future self? As Tyler tells him, without pain or sacrifice, we would have nothing. And once you have nothing, you can do anything. Thing. Meaning the narrator has to accept this pain, the suffering, before Tyler can give him the vinegar to neutralize it. And eventually, after accepting the pain, they begin selling the soap at high-end fashion stores, selling rich women their asses back to them. But now it's become clear that the narrator has fully transformed. For example, later at work, the narrator threatens his boss after he finds a printout of the rules of Fight Club. The first rule of Fight Club is you don't talk about Fight Club. Because he no longer fears his boss. He's now in charge. He's consciously moved above his boss. But it's not only the narrator who's going on this masculine journey. The narrator is now forming deep connections with the people around him, and the people around him now adore the narrator, with Bob telling the narrator how great a man he is. It's very clear that Fight Club is tapping into something repressed in these men, and this shared resentment and repression of the masculine becomes political, where in the words of Tyler Durden, an entire generation of people pumping gas, waiting tables, slaves with white collars, chasing cars and clothes, working jobs we hate so we can buy sh we don't need. With no purpose or place, the group decides that men from everywhere need to become uncomfortable, to be pushed away from the modern platitudes and back to their primal, raw, hungry selves. To do this, each member is assigned homework, like starting a fight with a random person, an assignment that causes the narrator to lose his job. And then there's other activities, such as smashing up people's television satellites, destroying Apple computers, puncturing cars, feeding birds to defecate in corporate beamers. At this point in the story, the narrator and Tyler are inching closer towards their master plan. Okay, but for everyone else, in the real world. This same bored up repression is being seen in another way. We're now seeing big changes in society. There are movements called men going their own way. We see these men called black pillars online who blame everyone but themselves for their own awful lives. We see mass depression and male suicide skyrocketing. It's clear that the issue addressed in Fight Club is certainly real. And it's why after two decades, men still feel so connected to this movie. Okay, but what's actually causing this? I mean, never in history have we seen such a decline in masculinity. Well, this brings us on to our second point for male weakness. 
Right now, we are the first generation of losers. I'm sure we all remember that Try Guys video, where they measured their testosterone and it was so low that it was below the average for an 85 to 100 year old man. But this video really wasn't as funny as it first seemed. The average testosterone used to be over 1000 nanograms per deciliter. Now the average for men is usually around 300 to 700 nanograms per deciliter. But the range has become so wide and so blurred that the Try Guys testosterone levels was considered healthy, which tells you a lot about modern society where men have the testosterone of 100 year old men. Because what are the results of this? Well, low testosterone men face a lot more depression, fatigue, low confidence, lower sex drive and ambition, which has an eerie correspondence to the growing mental health epidemic we're wallowing in. On the other hand, high testosterone men are aggressive, have increased muscle mass, increased facial hair with a higher sexual drive and more motivation. Which is why in the past, men acted like men. They faced discomfort and came together through unthinkable struggle, war, economic collapse, poverty, plagues. By 21, Alexander the Great had conquered most of Europe and was expanding into Asia. And I mean, just talk to your parents or grandparents who had houses in their 20s, raising children, working in mines, starting businesses. We did manual labor, we dug into the earth, we sweated it out every day, rain and shine. And now huge chunks of men are spineless wimps. I'm not trying to sound macho saying this, but it's a blunt reality. Men are being drowned in estrogen laced products. High estrogen causes men to take on feminine traits. They become less assertive with low energy. Their genital shrink and voices get higher, and then compounded by this is our testosterone killing lifestyle. I mean, it's now normal for the modern diet to consist of BPA plastics, sugar, alcohol, and a sedentary lifestyle. Beer bellies and weakness are the new norm for men. And it's why we're losing an entire generation of men to comfort. The average man is overstimulated beyond belief, accustomed to scrolling on apps on autopilot, living vicariously through other people's stories, whether it be through sports, video games, and social media, or adult content and OnlyFans, where you imagine you're the guy that's winning, all while sitting in your bed on your own doing nothing with your life. Added on to this is the millions of six-figure professionals who spend their lives making you weak, manipulating you through social media, food, and all the other endless comforts. Billion dollar companies using advanced AI to make you passive, comfortable, low testosterone mules. Split testing to keep you mired in an endless loop of distractions. Creating a generation of weak, pleasure-seeking droogs whose lives consist of waking up, scrolling on social media, and busting a nut. Entire countries are becoming weaker as we become lazy, instant pleasure-seeking men. There is no need to be strong anymore. All these comforts and distractions make life easier, and an easy life breeds weakness. Comfort kills creativity, and with this men are becoming insults at a frightening rate, because by detaching themselves from their masculinity and through being accustomed to comfort, they have no will to struggle or to strive for more. Men are losing that will to succeed, to be better, to improve. And when this weakness is normalized, when men around you are docile, lethargic, and apathetic, you accept being weak. You lower your standards for yourself and those around you. And this really is how civilizations collapse. Now in Fight Club, this collapse is seen through the radicalization of these men, who are forming stronger bonds and stronger dedication to Fight Club, highlighted with the membership initiation, where those who want to work in the top circle of Fight Club must go through grueling discomfort, standing outside for three days with no food, water, or shelter, where they are repeatedly threatened and told they're not wanted. The test is designed to filter out the weak and those who can delay their gratification. Once initiated, these men must shave their hair, wear the same clothes, and remove their names, ostensibly to reject consumerism but really to crush any individuality and make these men conform to the group. These men are then reduced to hard, manual labor, all while being repeatedly told they're not special, they're not individual, and it doesn't take long for the consequences to unfold. Later in the evening, the news reports on the destructive acts of anti-capitalist arson and vandalism. Because Fight Club is no longer about managing men's repression in modern society, it's now about seeking vengeance on the cause of their repression. And the pressure is building. This is seen in a car ride home, where the narrator talks with Tyler about Project Mayhem and the destruction they are causing. And Tyler admits he was the one who blew up the narrator's condo. He did this because when the narrator had nothing, he could become anything. It was the comforts that were putting him back from his potential. So to go back to the feeling of zero and freeing his mind, Tyler decides to crash the car. And when the narrator wakes up from the crash, he walks into an assembly line of men building soap and plotting their vengeance. Teams of men working tirelessly to get back at the society that rejected them. But this need for vengeance begins to take a much more sinister turn. After a failed assignment to destroy corporate art, the Fight Club members reveal that Bob was shot in the head. It's becoming clear that this need for vengeance is going way too far. And with all the madness building up around the narrator, he goes around America to find Tyler. And this is when he realizes the scope of the Fight Club movement. All the men around the country are united by the 
oppression. It's only in his search for Tyler does the narrator realize he is Tyler. Tyler is his masculine projection. Tyler is the part of him that has been repressed all these years as a wage slave. Tyler was the only way he could live the life he wished for, the person he needed to pretend to be, to get where he wanted to be. Every step within this film is Tyler's journey into becoming the man he'd always repressed inside of himself. And after realizing this, Tyler goes back to the house only to understand that all the soap making was for bomb making. It's now very clear what Fight Club is, what Project Mayhem is. It's a therapeutic release for Tyler to deal with his deep-seated emotional issues. After understanding this, Tyler goes into an emotional breakdown as he no longer has any identity. No one around him knows his true self, and he doesn't either. But before we get to the end of the story, we first need to understand the third and most important reason for all this male weakness, and that is the subversion of values and virtues. On a massive scale, we have seen our values being subverted. We see relentless hedonism being praised and rewarded as empowering. We see the family unit being desecrated. We are told that ownership and freedom are bad, that we won't own anything, that we shouldn't be free to say what we believe or act as we choose. We are always told to be the better person and never show aggression. When men are bullied, we are told not to defend ourselves. Even though we all know that you aren't the bigger person because you take it, we should reclaim that aggression and push back. But instead, we perpetuate weakness by telling men that being weak is a virtue, only for men to then carry up this bottled rage for the rest of their life, looking for any scapegoat, video game, or pill to release their inner repression. But when these values and virtues are subverted, when men no longer benefit from society anymore, when the essential elements to a meaningful life are stripped from men, when being a single lonely loser with no money, no ownership, no meaningful relationships or connections, and no respect is the norm for men, society crumbles. And our me first generation, we always want and expect more. We divorce from our lifelong partners for the hope of something better. We look for the next item, the next gadget, the next dopamine hit, and an endless loop. Because we are no longer attached to anything other than our need for more. Always chasing a dream and never realizing it will always be the same. We self-hate our own society and nations. We hate our leaders. We hate our culture and history. Our culture no longer seeks to uplift, but to denigrate our population. But when you are binded by the same values and virtues, you want to protect the society that you have. In fact, you will do everything to keep it. That's why you see strong men like President Zelensky out on the streets defending a nation from authoritarianism. A man, a country with virtue and aggression. And on the other hand, you see men in the West willing to give all of this away when they are no longer attached to any values or virtues, giving away their society in the hopes of something new, which is exactly what Fight Club shows us. During the final scenes of the film, Project Mayhem plans to bomb all the banks and credit card companies so that they can erase the debt record and everyone goes back to zero. Society restarts. And everyone senses this coming. The police know about it, waiters, cooks, bus drivers, everyone knows. And yet no one stands to defend the system. No one wants to protect it because no man benefits from that system anymore. They have no connection to it. Their lives, virtue and values have been subverted. So these men choose to destroy it and begin anew. And in the final acts, this repression is finally released. All these men who have been repressed, who are addicted to comfort, who have no deeper connection, who no longer see the benefits of modern society, they come together to tear it down. Because when men are weak, society falls. When men turn into repressed, placid, apathetic consumers with no virtue or values, with no masculinity, when these men are no longer embraced by the society, they will burn down that society to feel its warmth. Now here's a quick word from today's sponsor, Masterworks. Inflation's getting out of hand, with the US's inflation rate exceeding 7%, a rate that hasn't been seen since 1982. Not only that, but the Federal Reserve is set to increase interest rates and the S&P 500 is continuing to drop. So is your portfolio diversified and protected? If not, one company can help you do just that, Masterworks. Now commonly people hedge against inflation through gold, stocks, or real estate, but a more interesting alternative option is with rare art. The art market is valued at $1.7 trillion and is now projected to grow another 900 billion by 2026, according to Deloitte. With contemporary art prices now outpacing the S&P 500 total return by 164% from 1995 to 2021, which is why two thirds of billionaires allocate 10 to 30% of their overall portfolio to art. This is because art as an investment gives solid rates of appreciation with lower volatility than the stock market. And now Masterworks is providing one lucky viewer who signs up using my link and schedules a call with the Masterworks membership team access to a limited edition Cause Companion. The Cause Companion is an artwork done by Brian Donnelly and it's worth $825 in value. Masterworks will then choose the winner at random. But in order to be eligible, you must like this video and subscribe to my channel. The winner of this giveaway will then be announced in the next video. So join over 300,000 other members on the platform by clicking the link in the description below and skip the Masterworks waitlist.